and get started here. Uh, my name is Alex Florian. I'm from the Van Buren Conservation District. And I want to welcome you all to our second uh, backyard symposium. This is a week long series designed to help landowners of all sizes bring their yards to life as beautiful, sustainable parts of our environment. From backyards and lots to urban areas to rural homesteads, green space is beneficial to our mental and physical health and for the animals and plants we share our space with. Through this series, we're hoping you can learn actionable, approachable ways to make your space a little bit greener. Uh, go ahead in the chat and please introduce yourself and share what you'd like to learn and feel free to interact there throughout the presentation. By default, all attendees are muted with cameras off. This allows us to record these presentations to be uploaded on our YouTube channel later for those who couldn't join us today. Um, during the presentation, if you wanna ask us questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the uh, Zoom call on the toolbar. Uh, you can use that to submit questions to the presenter. Just type in your question and click send. Uh, questions will be asked by the moderator at the end of the presentation. If you need any help throughout the call, feel free to use the chat function to reach out to the VBCB moderator uh, for help using Zoom. Um, again, welcome to the Van Buren Conservation District's Backyard Symposium webinar series. Uh, you can message the Conservation District. Oh, can you go back? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can message the Conservation District by going to vanburencd.org slash contact dash two or sign up for our newsletter at the bottom of the website. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Webinars will be posted next week at youtube.com slash user slash Van Buren CD slash videos. You can also follow us on Facebook at Van Buren CD. Live captioning is available. It's at the bottom of the screen. It's a little box with two C's. Click on that. You should be able to see the captions. Uh, go on to the next slide. Today, I want to welcome Abby Bristol from the Southwest by Southwest Corner CISMA. She's our strike team coordinator, managing invasive plants through Berrien, Cass, and Van Buren counties through funding provided by the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. She aims to eradicate high priority invasive plants in Southwest Michigan, like stiltgrass and kudzu, promote biodiversity in high quality habitats, and eventually build a program to provide affordable invasive plant management for private landowners. She enjoys getting an up close look at flowers and the foliage with her fiance and her dog, Mike and Oxford. Thanks so much, Alex, for that great introduction. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Abby Bristol, and thank you so much for joining us today on this Valentine's Day. I hope you're spending it with a partner or some friends or reflecting on yourself and uh, whatever you're doing, I hope you're just gonna enjoy the day. Just a heads up, I will be asking attendees a couple of questions throughout the presentation. So I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat and get familiar with that chat feature. Um, and remember the Q&A button is for questions you want me to answer at the end and the chat button will be for uh, answering the questions I have for you. Um, so Alex mentioned a little bit about the SISMA, but I'll give you a bit more background about the SISMA. Um, I work for the Southwest by Southwest Corner SISMA. SISMA stands for Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. It's largely funded by the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program, but also lo uh, other local, state, and federal funding sources. Uh, the goal of SISMA is to provide education for land landowners and municipalities on invasive species, and also offering technical assistance for management and prevention of invasive species. Every county in the state of Michigan is part of a SISMA, so I encourage you to get to know yours. If you live in Van Buren, Berrien, or Cass counties, then you are part of the Southwest by Southwest Corner SISMA. My role in this organization is the strike team coordinator, which means that I coordinate a crew of two people in the strategic management of invasive species with grant, within grant funded projects. 
part of the reason I'm interested in this topic of natives and native ours is because I have seen how invasive species have damaged ecosystems. And I wonder where we would be if we had had a better understanding of the plants that we were intentionally planting in our landscapes. Now I just want to give you an I, I want to get an idea of my audience today. So using that chat feed that chat feature tell me if you have a native garden or if you um, have used you know you've used native ours or if you don't know that you've used native ours give me an idea of how native natives are in your garden um, while people are getting some things written into the chat I just want to say that this presentation in this presentation I'm not going to tell you if what is right and what is wrong but uh, I want to provide you the uh, research of this very new topic in science and explore the potential impacts of native ours. So going back to the chat, let's see, garden with few natives and native ours. Let me open this up. Milkweed as they pop up, love to see that. Started adding things, just learning about natives. Some natives planted before introduce some natives. Very cool. Keep chatting. I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Going on, let's see. So let's set the stage here. Our topic today is born out of, largely out of a paradigm shift that was arguably sparked by Douglas Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. You might have heard of this book or you might have read it yourself, but in this book, he discusses the findings of his research that largely compared the biodiversity found on native plants versus exotic plants. What he found was a plant native to the region that it's growing in is either is uh, pro it provides food, shelter, and a place for uh, insects, birds, and other wildlife to rear their young. And that was in contrast to exotic ornamentals that did not have the capacity to, to um, provide those, those habitat benefits for, um, for other, for wildlife. In the face of climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, this book really hit a chord with a lot of gardeners. Um, and when there's a lot of bad news in the world, but uh, native gardeners saw this as an opportunity um, to make a make make real change, real feasible. It's a real feasible and uh, enjoyable way to build resilience against the changes that are happening. However, in traditional horticulture, uh, non-native species are typically used. What we've seen as a result of this and what Doug Tallamy writes about is either new invasive species that directly impact the growth uh, and reproduction of, of native species, or we see ecological dead zones. And what I mean by that is you may have, maybe you have a um, whole neighborhood full of non-native plants that are, uh, that are growing, but those plants don't necessarily support a diversity of life. For example, a traditional garden may of non-natives may support three to five insect species, but a native garden could support dozens of insect species. And that thus supports more species in an ecosystem, more wildlife. Plants that plants really are the building blocks of our ecosystems. And when there aren't the right plants in the right place at the right time, there isn't anything for insects to eat. And the end going up the chain, no, nothing for birds and other animals and wildlife to eat. So in response to this, more and more gardeners are choosing to plant natives in their garden. But let's make sure that we're on the same page with and that we agree on definitions. First of all, I want to say that I'm going to be using cultivars and nativars interchangeably. Um, I will be using the, those as the same word, um, but let's talk about what a native species is. I'm defining that as a species that has evolved with the other species around it that are also a part of its environment in the region that it's currently growing. Um, in this slide, you're looking at four varieties of swamp milkweed. Photo A is the straight or wild type species that hasn't been artificially selected um, for certain characteristics, whereas B, C, and D are photos of three cultivars of that swamp milkweed. 
This is from a study that looked at how swamp milkweed nativars differed in, in their ecology to a wild type plant, but I'll talk more about that later. Let's talk about what a nativar is defined as. Um, the term was coined in 2008 by the profess a professor of horticulture from the University of Georgia. His name was Alan Armitage, and he says in this quote, if we use the term native ours, purists may not get as upset with us for stealing their plants and diluting the meaning of native. We will also reduce confusion and in fact, provide additional value to the native moniker. Using native ours will in the long run enhance the native plant moving, movement regardless of how it is defined. So I, a lot of tension was born out of this. When I first started looking into native ours, I found a lot of divisive language like this on both sides. Um, and so a controversy was born. Um, now there's this dichotomy controversy between the native ours against the use of native ours, um, where there's one camp that says uh, we, it's going to be boycott entirely in another camp that says it's necessary. The two sides that I uh, found within this community was one, the environmentally minded folks who held issue with producing a native that has been artificially selected with predictable characteristics and then cloning that plant. Um, the cloning therefore, given their in, in their arguments, um, reduces biodiversity and thus resilience to change. Uh, this camp is in contrast to the more horticulturally minded folks that believe that believe that native ours are are the only way to keep the native garden trend going. I believe that most dichotomies are false and most debates off aren't so often one or the other, but a mix of both options. And as far as the scientific literature goes in this topic, it seems that the question of are native ours acceptable in gardens? This question, the resounding answer in the literature is it depends. Um, and although native gardens have increased in popularity, it's still considered a niche market. In 2015, Dayton Wild and colleagues from the University of Georgia he conducted a survey of nurseries, landscape architects, and master gardeners to try to better understand if there's deterring factors for, that keep people from starting a native garden or from buying native plants. And three considerations emerged from those surveys. First of all, nurseries just didn't have a good selection of native plants, so they aren't readily available to gardeners to buy. Secondly, desirable characteristics were limited, like character characteristics like flowers that last the whole season, foliage of different colors, or disease resistance. And thirdly, people just don't have native species on their radar. The average gardener may be entirely unaware of the benefits of gardening native plants. So to grow what could be seen as a niche market into something that is accessible to the average gardener, native ours is seen, are seen as a solution. The solution fits well for horticulture, for the horticultural industry because it's nothing new. Cultivars are nothing new in, um, in, hortical, in the horticultural industry. But it's much more of a nuanced situation than supply and demand and desirable characteristics. Um, I mean, after all, the native the native plant, native gardens became so popular because it was a way to take part in a movement to build resilience to climate change and the biodiversity crisis. But if natives are going through an artificial selection process, what does that mean for their place in the ecosystem? Are they still able to provide food to birds or pollinators and other in, uh, insects? But thinking economically, nurseries won't be able to carry, continue to carry natives if they aren't profitable. So it has been argued that native, um, argue, has, it has been argued that the only way to increase native plant use in gardens is to accept the use of native ours. And unless you're buying strictly so locally sourced seeds or locally sourced plugs that you know um, the origin of from specialty nurseries, you've probably bought a native R. 
According to a study that was conducted by the Mount Cuba Center, it's a botanical garden in Delaware, a quarter of the plants sold in nurseries were considered native. But of those plants, a of that quarter, a, a, an additional quarter of those plants were wild type varieties. So in other words, um, for every one wild type native plant that was sold in nurseries, two nativars were sold. And this was according to the um, the literature in 2000, uh, 2017 for the United States. So if that's the case, and if more native R's are being developed for sale, then what concerns exist for the use of native R's? Well, first of all, in order to sell flowers, there needs to be a certain level of quality control. Cultivating plants is a way to do this. You can select four desirable traits of a plant and choose the ones that are hardy enough that will survive the inevitable travel and transplanting phases. But this means that only certain clones make it to gardens. It's well understood that genetic diversity is needed to provide ecological surface, uh, services to other species in its environment. Um, according to a paper written in 2018 uh, by a student of Doug Tallamy's, her name's Emily Besden, uh, there are two ways that a cultivated native could impact a plant and insect relationship. The first being deterring the, the insect from a, uh, due to a change in the plant's chemistry. Maybe that's um, a change in the, in the taste of the leaves um, or how easy it is to eat the leaves. Maybe it's too tough. Or two, the quality of the food has changed. In other words, it's less nutritious. Often if a species, um, if a species leaves are bigger in one plant versus uh, a neighbor of the same species, the, amounts, uh, the amount of vitamins and minerals available in those bigger leaves goes down because they have to span more area. So each individual bite of an insect is actually less nutritious, meaning they have to eat more. So if natives are being cultivated, do those cultivars accomplish the goals of a native garden? Those providing, do they provide food, shelter, and a place where wildlife can rear their young? So the science on this question is actually quite young. The conversation really just started about two decades ago. Uh, the research that is available is pretty narrow. There's data for select species um, rather than looking holistically at the biodiversity of a native garden and relating that to the biodiversity of a wild type garden. Um, but the research currently available does often end up at similar conclusions. Um, as a plant's characteristics change, so does its relationship with the insect species that interact with it. So for example, a study was done, it was conducted in 2007 by Emily Tenzar, and she looked at how the feeding habits of a nine bark specialist called the nine bark beetle changed when different characteristics of the plant were changed. So in this paper, it was found that the beetle didn't eat the purple leaved nine bark varieties, but neither disliked nor preferred the yellow leaved nine bark varieties. So native ours can't really be assessed as a whole, and instead it should be, they should be carefully considered and researched on a case-by-case -case basis. In the 2018 paper that I mentioned earlier, Emily Besden looked into how cultivating common, not common native woody plants impacted the relationship where, with their associated insects. And it was found that when the foliage changed from green to either red, purple, or blue, the insects didn't feed. And though insects didn't seem deterred when fruiting was enhanced or uh, there was a disease resistance or they had an altered growth habit, um, they, uh, these, these characteristics didn't change if insects were, how much the insects were eating. However, leaf variegation did. In fact, what they saw with the leaf variegation is insects actually ate more. And what they mentioned in this article was it was probably something like what I mentioned earlier with the bigger leaves. Uh, variegated leaves weren't as nutritious, and so more had to be eaten by the insect. Um, so herbivory was actually, actually stimulated. In another paper written in 2020, uh, Adam Baker and his colleagues compared wild type milkweeds, swamp, mil swamp milkweed and butterflyweed, with three cultivars of each species. 
The plants differed primarily in height, width, and how much milky sap they produced. And what they found was monarch butterflies and 17 different species of bees all seemed to like the plants, the six plants, more or less the same, regardless of if it was cultivated or native. However, the study does explicitly, uh, did explicitly say that leaf shape, leaf color, and leaf variegation were not considered. And the authors note that if plant breeders were to change the shape or the colors of the leaves, it could affect the monarch's ability to perceive this plant as somewhere to lay her eggs. So let's zoom back a little bit. We've looked at the individual cultivars and some, some effects of how they change, but let's zoom, zoom back and look at Andrea Kramer's um, paper from 2019. Um, this is a really interesting paper that investigated 761 different cultivars of 72 different species and how well suited those cultivars were for two different types of sites. The first site being a large undisturbed site that sites that are near enough to a natural landscape to reproduce with other plants that grow naturally. So think like a restoration site, whereas the second type of site is small disturbed areas that don't easily reproduce with natural sites. So think like your urban garden or your or a suburban garden. And the large undisturbed sites, only 3% of cultivars were found to be suitable. And so this means that only a very few cultivars that they studied were able to adapt enough to the natural variation of soils, climate, sun, avail sun, availab sun availability, and so on. However, in the small disturbed sites, 52% of the cultivars that they looked at were found to be suitable for those urban, suburban garden type areas. The biggest factor that affected these affected the cultivars that did well in the uh, in the suburban and urban gardens were the was climate, not the type of soil or how adaptable it it is to change, but can it survive the heat, the cold, the drought, the humidity, whatever. According to these authors, it wasn't crucial for these species to have the genetic diversity of wild type plants. And as long as a plant can survive in the given climate in the urban and suburban gardens, it may still provide ecosystem functions and pose few risks. Um, it, they are clear to say, however, that the caveat with this, if you do decide to go with cultivars in a garden setting, um, that it can't just be any cultivar. Like we mentioned earlier, there are characteristics of cultivars that may keep it from interacting with insects and other life, uh, other wildlife. In fact, 25% uh, of the cultivars of this study differed so greatly from the wild type, their wild type counter counterpart, that their the cultivars' ability to support pollinators and other species could actually be compromised. So we've looked at a uh, just a snapshot of the research on this topic, but like I said, this is a very new subject of research, and that means that there are a lot of questions that remain, like could a native R hybridize with native wild uh, with a native wild type? If um, native uh, native R's are more able to more available than uh, wild type natives, what does that mean for land restoration projects? Um, what are the lasting impacts of native ours? We just have a lot of questions that are unanswered still and more research is needed to answer them. So I hope you leave today understanding that this is a nuanced topic and like many things, it requires one to be intentional and informed about, about their decisions. Going forward, if you have a native garden or if you're planning one, I encourage you to start with and prioritize native wild types rather than cultivars. But based on the research we discussed, I want to leave you with a few with a list of a few things um, to look out for if you do plan to buy a native R. First and foremost, avoid the red, purple, and blue leaves. As we found with um, some of the research we looked at today, this seems to deter insects from eating it which diminishes its ecological functions. Um, also avoid flower changes. And what I have two, I have two examples of that here. First of all is a double flower. And if you don't know what a double flower is, it means that the reproductive structures of the flower have been converted to petals and therefore don't provide any nectar or pollen. Another example of a flower change would be something like longer nectar spurs. A nectar spur is a tube that comes out the back of a flower 
and it holds nectar. Often those are associated with certain specialist species like hummingbirds, moths, or other pollinators that have a very specific uh, beak or tongue length that allows them to get the nectar. But if the nectar spur is longer, that tube is longer, they're no longer able to reach that food source. I also hugely encourage you to support local businesses and purchase from small nurseries that specialize in invasive plant, or sorry, not in invasive plants, that specialize in native plants. Um, and it's not just me saying this, this is also a suggestion supported by the literature. And when you are at the nursery, don't be afraid to ask questions about the ecological functions of the plant. Getting involved in this kind of dialogue with nurseries encourages them to be proactive about developing native ours that are ecologically functional. I also want to leave you with a few words of caution, um, as we've found with the unintended consequences of so many ornamentals that became invasive, we just don't know what the consequences are of cultivating native plants. So I encourage you to start with natives, give them a chance in your garden, get to know them. Um, what's their preferred soil? What's their preferred climate or their sun exposure? And what other plants do they like to be around? I also encourage you to keep coming to events like this and to listen to the science, be critical of where you get your information from. And finally, I encourage you to take part in citizen science. It can be super easy, as easy as downloading an app. Um, the two that I have here are iNaturalist, which you may, you may have heard of. It's a great app for identification, but I also like to use it for where I find plants, when I find plants, and um, seeing uh, what plants I can find in that season, in a given season. There's also Budburst. This is relatively new to me, but it's a really cool app. It's more focused on how plants are changing as uh, climate change goes on. And so what it asks for is it has you take a picture, it helps you identify what it is, and then asks you question, questions regarding that plant, where that plant is in its life cycle. Some final thoughts here is uh, I just want to say that, again, I'm not here to tell you what the right answer is to this situation, natives or native ours, because I don't have it. Um, what we've discussed today is the latest research on the topic, but really I don't want you to get bogged down by the debate. Don't get bogged down on natives versus native ours, really because it's not the root of the issue. It's native gardens became came across came along and grew in popularity because they were a solution um, that an individual could take part in to address the climate and biodiversity crises that we're facing. Um, again, support your local native specialty nurseries and get involved to really uh, be involved in the change and in the good work that's happening here. Volunteer at stewardship days with, your, with local land conservancies, discourage new development and contribute to restoration efforts. Throughout this presentation, I used a number, I used all of these resources here. Um, and if you are interested in getting any of these sources, please feel free to email me or put it in the chat. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much. I think I got done really early, but I'm happy to take a bunch of questions. Yeah, thank you. That was so great, Abby. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, please leave your contact info up while we answer some of them. Um, while people are putting their questions in the chat, remember you can use the chat or the Q&A. I was wondering if you knew of any good like example gardens of native, uh, good native plantings around Van Buren County or Southwest Michigan. That people yeah, can... yeah. So this picture right here that you're looking at is actually from Liberty Hyde Bailey Museum, um, and they have a really lovely garden behind the behind the museum. This is in South Haven, Michigan. Um, I really love theirs. They did a good job with spring spring ephemerals and and other plants that other flowers that flower throughout the season. Um, let's see, where else? Native gardens. Um, I live in Kalamazoo and I'm really surprised at how many people in the Vine neighborhood and uh, have, um, have native gardens, specifically Monarch Way Stations. Um, and I believe Monarch Way Stations, it's something that you can get uh, 
a little sign for and get recognition for, and there might even be a map on their website. Awesome. Um, a couple people have dropped links to a uh, list of businesses in the chat that have native plants for sale. Yes, um, great. That's what I like to see. Uh, someone asked if you could show the last resources slide. Sure. Uh, Yep. That is a combination of both, um, like the Alan Armitage, Armitage quote um, was just, a, uh, I think, an essay that he wrote, but there's also um, primary literature here, so the actual research, and then there's articles like the Wild Ones and what they, uh, their stance on Native ours. Um. Someone asked, uh, which native virus have you found to be problems for insects? That's a great question. And I will say that I personally don't have enough in uh, background in a specific native, native, native or native R. Um, this is just the research that I've uncovered. Um, but from based on the research that I've looked into, it sounds like the uh, any native R that has been too far removed from its um, native wild type has is more likely to, to compromise those um, those relationships. And so if I have a, a milkweed plant that has heart shaped leaves instead of the, the long lance shaped leaves, then a, a monarch may not see it as something that it's able to lay its, lay its eggs on. Or if I have a um, a plant who, whose leaves are usually really uh, fragile and thin, and instead now they're thick and have this waxy cuticle over them. Although that might be useful for some things in a garden, the uh, either specialists or generalist insects aren't able to chew that up and eat it. So really you wanna look for those big difference, uh, the big differences between natives and cultivars. Cool. Um, Susan asked, they have many plants which bring in monarchs in their garden, and they also have some praying mantis that control the bugs in the vegetable garden, but they also end up getting the monarchs. I wondered mm -hmm. if you had any advice on how to balance kind of those two. Oh issues. man, you know, I, I really don't. I'm not sure um, in the ecology on that. I wonder if um, a if increasing other biodiversity there would be would be helpful. Maybe adding something that adding plants that support even more insects to try to get the um, the praying mantis to keep them from moving towards the monarchs, maybe having um, other specialists, other uh, plants that have specific specialists so that you're not uh, um, leading the praying mantis to the monarchs, so to speak, for lack of a better term? It's a good question. Yeah, another question we have here um, in the chat, Andrea asked about like which native plants uh, would be good to plant. Uh, Abby, do you have any suggestions on natives that we might be able to find in Southwest Michigan and try to plant? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so specifically, it's going to depend be dependent on your site. Um, if you have a wet site, you want to go with the species that like to have their feet wet. Um, if you've got a, like an upland site, you want to make sure that it's more of a facultative upland plant. Um, there are a number of resources you can utilize to determine which plant makes sense for your site. Um, I would say start with a, a native plant nursery. So that is something like hidden savanna, or if you're starting from seed, you could you could go with, um, oh, what's Jared Foster's uh, company called? Native Connections um, or wild, wild Type in Mason, starting with them and let get starting that conversation with um, the nursery and saying, hey, this is what my site looks like. Um, what sort of species do you have that would fit, would, would fit? Um, I'm not 
blessed with a garden, so I don't get to practice that very much, unfortunately. I would love to give you some specific uh, species, but it would just be my favorites from the forest. Cool. Um, do you feel it is important to obtain plants or seeds that have been shown to be native to more specific areas than just Michigan, perhaps like native at the county level or landscape level? Ooh, big question. That is a good question. Um, and people don't really know, and I'm not really, and I'm I'm not really sure. But I think it's I if again, like I said earlier, I don't really believe that any two dichotomies. I don't really believe in dichotomies, and it's probably a mixture of both. I wonder if um, we leveraged the the genotypes that are around us, that are specifically around us, especially in natural areas, if they better, if we have genotypes, specific um, genes for a natural area that's near us, then maybe we want to keep those genes going and not introducing something from, from outside um, because these genes really know what they're doing and they really know this forest or they really know this prairie um, versus a urban environment or suburban environment where they need their, they might need some help. They haven't had experience. Um, they being the genotypes haven't had experience in this particular environment. So maybe incorporating the genes from elsewhere would give them the, the tools, the genetic tools to actually take, uh, to be more adapted for where they're at, somewhere that's more disturbed or somewhere that's, um, has a different soil type or a different sun exposure. So I think it's a really big question and it's a really good question. And it could be a, honestly, it could be a whole master's thesis. <laughs> yeah. And especially also with climate change kind of forcing the ranges of a lot of plants up, what the genotypes that have been able to succeed around here aren't necessarily the ones that are going to be able to succeed in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good point. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a complicated one. Mm -hmm. Great um, question, though. Interesting one. Circling back to a question from earlier, um, are there any praying mantids that are native to our area? I know we have a couple invasive ones. Yes, we do have a one praying mantis that I am aware of. It's the little one. Um, so if you see the real big ones, those I believe are Chinese um, and those are considered invasive. But we do have a praying mantis that is it is native. Awesome. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, I'm going to put my this slide yeah, back up. Contact info back up. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to send an email out or drop it in the chat in the next like two minutes. Um, Looks like no more questions. I'm so, going to go on to the next slide. Yep, go on to the next slide. First, I want to thank everyone for coming to the session of the Van Buren Conservation District's Backyard Symposium webinar series. Uh, we hope you'll join us for more of these sessions. I also want to thank Abby for taking the time to present to us today. Um, like we said at the beginning, you can message us with the contact form on our website at vanburencd.org slash contact dash two, or sign up for our newsletter using the subscribe option at the bottom of our website. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and recorded webinars will be posted next week at youtube.com slash user slash vanburencd slash videos. You can follow us on Facebook at vanburencd. And I think next slide. Yeah. Yep. And tomorrow you can join us at the same time, two o'clock for Beyond the Bees Knees with Charlotte Hubbard. Uh, that's going to be a fun one about bees. Uh, yeah, let me just double check. We haven't had any more questions. Or, yep, we got a question from Lisa in the chat. Um, he was horrified when she saw someone stomp on a praying mantis, but now knowing that they are foreign and invasive, is it best to kill them? Oh, man. I mean, 
I, I mean, probably that I, I stopped, I focus on plants because I can't kill insects and, and, and other things. So I am going to channel what I have heard from other people and say, yes, but I couldn't do it. And then, uh, I think we had one, someone asked if we could forecast what we'll be covering for the rest of the week on our uh, backyard symposium stuff. So give me one second. Uh, pull that up. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Yeah. Can everyone see that? I see your desktop. It's not right. You share. Take yours and share. How about now? Yeah. Cool. So tomorrow we're going to have Beyond the Bee's Knees with Charlotte Hubbard. Um, Wednesday we have Don't Spray, Let the Insects Spray, or Let the Insects Pray with Christopher Imler. On Thursday we have an introduction to the Mushrooms of Michigan with Christopher Swinson. And on Friday we have an introduction to permaculture with Garrett Heater. All this information can be found at vanburencd.org slash events.